Welcome back. You know, um, you could stay up with Priest at 11. Carolyn, we're ready oh. to go. We're ready to go back, Carolyn. All right. Excellent. So soccer, uh, just like our cricket session, is is one of the most uh, popular sports around the globe. Foot and ankle injuries are a big part of that. Uh, Victor is going to be moderating this and uh, taking us through some of the more common injuries that happen in the foot and ankle. He's got a fantastic global uh, um, faculty to join us. I do want to thank Miris for their sponsorship for the session. Victor, it's all yours. Hey, Celine, thank you for organizing this great meeting online from all over the world internationally. It's fantastic running uh, so over the night. Also, uh, really, uh, I appreciate very much. And I want to um, introduce um, my friends here. And you can see we are um, talking about foot and ankle injuries in soccer. And after um, my own presentation on OCLs, uh, Jesus will uh, talk about the ankle instability. Arthroscopically, Daniel uh, will talk about the ultrasound importance in soccer players. Eric will then address the Jones fractures. And finally, Koji will also talk about the Ossi Pubulare in soccer. So um, let me start from myself. Um, Let me go here. Yes. So you know that um, um, soccer injuries are very common, especially in the lower leg. But if you look here at the lower leg, the ankle and foot injuries are the most common one. As you can see here in this uh, FIFA analysis. Um, so uh, it's an area where um, there are severe injuries. Of course, uh, the majority can be treated conservatively, but at the end, we surgeons, foot and ankle surgeons, have to uh, perform uh, surgeries in such athletes. Let me talk about the OCLs in two things. The one in acute ankle sprain, so um, not necessary um, syndesmotic uh, sprains. And secondly, I will talk about syndesmotic and OCL. And I want only to bring cases because this may, makes the whole thing really more uh, interesting. So here you have a 27 years uh, professional soccer player. And you can see here on his right ankle already on the OR table, how you can open medially. And on the left ankle, do you have a, a nice stability? If you look at the x-rays, which um, we got before, uh, you don't see much except that you see on the medial side an avulsion on the deltoid. You see it also on the AP view of the foot. And here, when you do then uh, an MRI, you see a complete rupture of the deltoid. But you see also on the uh, lateral talus and OCL, as you see in the upper picture. In the Arthur CT, you see also a possibility um, of showing, um, you know, the deltoid ruptures, but also OCLs. You see there is a lateral ankle OCL in combination with this deltoid rupture. Arthroscopically, uh, this was confirmed. You see in the upper uh, pictures, you see no OCL in the center, but you see on the on here on the left picture and deltoid rupture completely and here you don't see it very well in this picture but it was an acute OCL on the lateral talus and here you see the uh, the situation uh, open you see there is a complete rupture of the deltoid not only the superficial one but also the deep one and uh, and also a, a posterior tibial tendon um, injury was also seen which we had to address at the same time and then also the OCL be debrided uh, laterally. And here you can see the, uh, the after treatment, six weeks with this walker. And you see that we place in these cases, even an insole in the walker inside to really deload completely the deltoid. Another case is this one. Um, uh, this is um, a severe injury. If you look at the video, and now, which will come now, is the red guy 
who will be injured. And you can see now the left foot, look at this, it's a knee version uh, injury. And um, here you would expect that he would have, you know, an, a, a severe syntesmotic injury, which he didn't have, but he had, you know, a deltoid lesion. And also um, interesting, also um, not only a lateral, but also a medial acute OCL of the medial talus. So it, um, in this case, we had not only an EBA, now you see the OCL there, um, in this case, we had not only, you know, a lateral OCL like here, which is typically with a deltoid lesion, but also a medial one. And, and this, you see here, the lateral OCL. Here you see also how the interesting, uh, the lateral ankle ligaments were also torn, even a, a, a bony uh, lesion here of the fibula. And uh, here you see the lateral OCL here. Um, now you see it, how it's it's a wide OCL acute. So the question is, what should we do with this uh, OCL? And here is the our solution. We went in into that, and then we did the PRP infiltration together with fibrin glue. So, um, and this way we could, um, you widely repair or attach this OCL to the lateral talus back again. And here you can see this is the anterior syndesmosis injury, but the interosseous ligament was, um, was not torn. So um, we could just repair here this uh, anterior tibiofibular ligament, the anterior uh, syndesmotic ligament. And also we repair then uh, the ATFL and CFL and also the medial side, we repaired the deltoid also. So you can see how OCLs can happen, you know, in a, in a, in ankle sprain cases. Now here you see um, another soccer player. Um, if you look carefully at the AP X-ray on the left side, you see that there is something going on there, like an acute OCL. And here you see the arthro CT also. You see there is not only this OCL on the lateral talus, but there is a complete rupture of the um, lateral ligament complex. Here you see the, uh, um, the problematic, the lateral OCL on the left side, and also here the medial um, deltoid lesion. And here you see this OCL was completely flipped, was uh, acute, completely flipped, quite large, as you can see here. So we fix this with a bioresorbable pin, as you can see here. And um, here you save the video after the fixation of the OCL. And then uh, we fix the lateral ligaments and also the medial ligaments on the other side. So, um, OCLs together with syntesmotic injuries are very common. Here another case, if you look then carefully, it will be the red player injured, and this also um, a typical lesion. And now you see it, he will be hit by this uh, team colleague now. So you see it's a eversion external rotation injury of the ankle joint. When you look at these cases, like now here in the normal x-rays that we got from the team, you don't see much, you know, you think um, this is not a severe injury. So when you don't uh, know exactly the mechanism and you are not an expert, you can miss this injury as a normal ankle sprain. Here you see the problem. It's also a mesonef fracture there. And here we see the, um, the deltoid uh, injury. We see also the syntesmotic injury as you can see in this enhanced um, picture on the right side. So the uh, injury, the um, syntesmosis is completely torn. You see here also the uh, medial uh, deltoid lesion. You see also an acute OCL lesion here on the medial talus. And here you see all the problems that we have in this case. So we have the syntesmotic injury, uh, we have the mesonef, the deltoid and the OCL on the medial side. So, and here we repaired um, by a screw 
Typically, we use um, a tightrope uh, for uh, cases in this in this motic area. But when when we have a simultaneous um, mesonef fracture, then we go to screws. And here we repair also the deltoid and also the OCL on the medial talus we deprived. So and this was eight weeks post-op. We removed the screws, and uh, after five months. The, the patient or the player was back back to uh, the game. So this was from my side, just um, in quickly and, and shortly, the OCLs in, in ankle sprains and the, in syndesmotic injury. The syndesmosis injury was already taught this morning in this course, but um, now I would like to give uh, the word to Jesus, uh, Jesus Villa. Yes. yes. From Madrid. Jesus, please um, yeah. uh, go ahead. Okay. So thanks a lot, Selene and Victor, for your kind invitation. It's my pleasure to participate in this great meeting. I'm coming from Madrid. I work in both um, private hospital, and I am associated a professor of the university and associated editor of the Food and Ankle Surgery and editor-in-chief of the Orthopedic and Trauma Spanish Journal. So I collaborate with these companies in educational programs, and I love soccer. I love Real Madrid, of course. I support them. And when we talk about soccer, we are talking about Real Madrid history. So uh, Victor told about that. It's one of the most common injuries in the soccer players and the management is conservatively in most of the cases. And it's very important to do a correct, a proper prevention for the, this kind of lesions. So this is a very unfortunate topic and the number of publication is increasing in the, in the recent years. So it's a really nice topic. And also in this nice paper of Victor, it's very important to keep in mind that more almost 80% of post-traumatic ankle osteoarthritis is because first, it's post-traumatic, first anchor fractures, and second instability. And this is a very important message that we have to keep in mind. So we have a really universe around the chronic ankle instability. In the 60s, it looks like we have just a functional or mechanical one, but we have also some conditions like hypermobility, syndetmotic instability, the concept of the rotational instability, also the subtalar joint rule and of course, the micro instability and some conditions like virus deformity or corneal instability. And in most of them, the arthroscopic role is really important. It's important to correct the misalignment in those cases of virus deformity. Of course, the peroneal dislocation, most cases concurrent with the virus deformity, lateral ankle instability. And in those cases, the deepening of the fibular growth Tendoscopy is an excellent procedure. We can do also a dynamic exploration of the tendons. The hypermobility is not pathological, but it's very important in order to decide which kind of treatment we are going to offer the patient. Of course, the syndesmotic instability and a new concept about the 360 degrees of the ankle. So in most patients, we can have also a median instability, and in those acute or sub-acute cases, we can do, we can practice a direct repair of the deltoid ligament, like in, in this case. And of course, the subtalar instability, where we have to be very, very, very attention to the calcanofibular ligament and the role in the both ankle and subtalar instability. And more than 30% of subtalar instability coexists with an ankle instability. So we have, this is the ideal patient that's a soccer player with an ankle instability, hypermobility, and a complete rupture of the ATFL ligament. But we have to keep in mind also some kind of neuromuscular deficits, reaction times, postural control deficit that is very important, not only in the prevention, but also in the surgical physiotherapy after surgical procedure. But I'm going to focus in the anterolateral chronic ankle instability. We have different options. Nobody takes the coffee the same way. So we have to individualize the treatment. 
And of course, it's very important to avoid all of non-anatomical techniques, especially those that use the perineal brain tendon because worse functionality, stiffness, pain, and high risks of osteoarthritis. So mainly we have three kinds of techniques, thyroid repair, augmentation, or analograph. And this is also a very important message. So I'm going to speak about when, why, and how to treat the chronic ankle instability. So most of the cases we have a good tissue of the ATFL and the rupture is in the fibular insertion. So in these cases, more or less 70% of all my procedures, this is an excellent option to do a direct repair. As you can he see here, there is a rupture of the fibular insertion of the ATFL. So we start using the anterior medial portal and I modify the, the anterolateral portal in order to go properly to the ATFL insertion. It's very easy to identify because we have the footprint just below the anterior fibular ligament insertion. So it seems that it's okay, but it's not. There's a rupture, there's a small rupture and the, the ligament is not competent. So you can see an excellent quality of the tissue. So in those cases, the diary repair is easy and a nice procedure. We use a nitinol to pass through the ligament. I prefer to use two devices and two sutures in order to a more correct distribution of the strength of the of the repair and, and, and also for the for the force, reinforce it. You can see also the peroneal tertius tendon. So we are going to do indirectly a, an extensor release also. So after we have the two sutures in the in the remain tissue, we use this kind of devices, not less. So in those cases with this kind of devices, the, the, the tissue is going to be a little, a little bit below the, the anchor. So I prefer to go a little bit up and you can see perfectly the footprint insertion and where is the the place of the anterior tibiofibular ligament, the anterior inferior fascicle. So that's the final aspect of the repair, and this is a with excellent results. But in those cases where the, the rupture is not in the fibular insertion, but it's in the tire insertion of the med substance. So we have two main options. The first one is to do use an internal brace. In this morning session, there was some question about that, and some people speak about that. Personally, I don't like very much because first, it's very difficult to control the proper strength of the internal brace. And in second place, I don't like the, the synthetic fibers. So we have the other option that's to use analograph. There are several papers at the ends of the 90s and, and the beginning of the 20s with excellent results. So we publish also this kind of re allograph reconstruction, arthroscopic, and you can see in this short video, all the, the, the issues of an chronic ankle instability from the anterior portal, we can access to the transverse ligament, the osteochondrial lesion at the end of the tibial plafond. So it's very easy to identify the talar insertion of the ADFL. So in this position, we, we used to do a blind tunnel. About, we need an analograph of 4.5 millimeters. So that's the native uh, ligament. So after that, we identify in the footprint what is the, the fibular insertion of the ATFL. And in those cases, we used to do a complete tunnel. I use, use just a, a modified anterolateral portal. And after that, I just start fixing the the graph in the in the talus with a bio bio shooter screw and after that I I take the the allograph from the fibular tunnel. We are now finished to fix the fish in the the ligament in the in the talar tunnel. This is an excellent solution for those cases with a bad tissue quality or other conditions that we are going to see now. And after that, I use a biotinidesis screw for fix the, the graph in the in the fibular tunnel. As you can see in this image, 
So we are fixing the, the graph. And this is an excellent option, especially in those cases of high level athletes or soccer players in revision surgery, in hypermobility and obesity. And in those cases, we have to keep in mind, this is an important message that we have to do something more. Synthetic fiber tape, internal brace or analograph. And I personally prefer the allographs. And also in those cases with poor tissue quality, when there is an ocicle or major instability or doubts about the CFL quality and subtalar joints, we have to do something with the CFL ligament. And this is also an important message. The important rule of the CFL ligament in the ankle and subtalar is stability. And in those cases, we used to do a double reconstruction of both fascicles. This is uh, an interesting case of a professional soccer player. I think we have some problems with the video. So, okay. In, in those cases, we, we used to do uh, the same way that I saw you before, the ATFL reconstruction, and after that, we use with a for the reconstruction of the CFL um, fascicle. So and that's some uh, consideration, philosophical consideration about the soccer players. I think that is very important, not only the prevention, the prevention, but only the proprioception exercises. It's very important to individualize the treatment because the age, the season moment, the contractual situation, the manager relationship, if he's playing at the beginning or not, if he's not at the end of his career. And of course, I think that we must be conservative and less is more in those cases. So to take away message, a correct assessment of the patient is essential, evaluating misalignment and pathology of the tendonal tendons, direct repair and anatomical reconstruction techniques will be the choice. And the calcanofibular ligament plays an important role in ankle and subtalar stability. So thanks again, Selene and Victor for the invitation and thanks my team for welcoming me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jesus, for your nice presentation. And uh, now we continue with uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel Baumfeld from uh, Brazil. He will talk about the ultrasound. And at the end, we will discuss them a little bit all together. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks, Celine, for the great uh, meeting that you are uh, presenting for all of us. And we are going to talk about the ultrasound as a tool to diagnose and treat foot and ankle injuries. This is a topic that I like the most because I use it a lot every day in my daily practice. So to present myself, for those who don't know me, I am from Brazil in the city that uh, I point here in the middle country of Brazil. So it's uh, far away from a lot of you guys. <laughs> and I am a gym professor for the Federal University from my state. And uh, I am uh, a doctor from a, a very big team here in Brazil, one of the greatest team uh, here in my country. And I am in love about soccer. And my disclosures are here for Artrex, Geishelis, and uh, Meg Sharpdome. And one of my disclosures that I, I like a lot to work in field with athletes. So for, for us orthopedic surgeons today, it is considered that the ultrasonography is like our stethoscope, like the clinicians use to see and to imagine and to take the anatomy for, through our hands. It is an available and expensive and dynamic image technique. And we are used to perform atroscopy. So the ultrasonography is a complementary technique that can help us to manage a lot of um, muscle disease. We can also see and treat a lot of disease, uh, use our knowledge, our anatomic knowledge. So routinely use of ultrasound when treat soccer players help us to uh, treat in-field acute injuries, help us to analyze the healing process of the ligaments, of the joint, uh, and help us also to use adjuvant procedures, in-field adjuvant procedures. We don't need to send the players 
to a hospital. We don't need to send the players to uh, clinics. We don't need to send the players to uh, see another colleagues uh, for the radiologists, for example. We can use uh, the, the infield ultrasound to give uh, more confidence to, to the players. We can also uh, be very, very precise when inject and when aspirate hematomas or joints. So here is the, the, the office that we have uh, in, in our, our team. So the players can go off the field and we can also see everything that's going on through the joints, through the muscles, uh, right and uh, uh, at the right time and very fast. I'm going to give you guys some example how I manage this kind of lesions. So here is a lateral ankle sprain. We can see that in soccer, uh, we got a lot of movements. We got a lot of stop and start movements. So a lateral ankle sprain, when we can analyze right uh, in, in, in the time of the injury, we can see that the ultrasound help us to double check if we have uh, an ATFL, for example, uh, tear in the fibula, in the middle tear, or in the talus. And the ultrasound help us to see it is an intact ligament or a tear ligament. Here we can see and we can follow the player watching uh, the clinical evaluation where we can see above uh, the injury ligament and we can see the anterior dot joint test and we can double checking every day to see the healing of the ligament and we can also check uh, the healing of the clinical aspect of the joint. So we can manage the image, we can manage the clinical evaluation to help the players to get back uh, more fast in the field. He was a very nice case. We got a defender who had an, an ankle sprain and he gave, uh, present a proximal detachment of the TFL. And with this proximal detachment, here we can see uh, pointed in the ultrasound image he followed with a, a subcutaneous uh, synovial fluid came in through the do joint. So he's taking a lot of time to get better. So the healing process was too slow. And we performed a guided ultrasound aspiration and injection of a, a PRP or PRF. So we can see that uh, using the ultrasound, we can aspirate all the fluid we can check the exactly uh, uh, part of the ligament were uh, uh, detached, and then we can inject, and then we can treat the players uh, very fast. So for the medial ankle sprain, it's almost the same. Here we can see a player with a, a, a medial ankle sprain as the same way as Victor showed us. Here in the ultrasound image, we can see the medial malleolus, and we can also see the detachment and the injury of the deltoid, the superficial deltoid tear of the ligament. So we can also take the injury side and compare to the non-injury non side. So here is the deltoid rupture on our left and the normal deltoid on our right. So if we have uh, a little doubt about it, we can double check to the non-injury side. And this help us to specific analyze where are the injury. And here I'm using the ultrasound sound image to inject the PRF in the right side uh, uh, of the tear. And then it can start to help the player to get back in the field faster. And we can also follow the healing process of the ligament. This is a very nice case with a, a, a winger, a very fast player that we have in, in our team. He started with a chronic forefoot pain and we took him for some images and we checked that he present a calcification of the second lumbrical muscle. So it's the same way that it happens in the rotator cuff so we uh, started to uh, discuss about what to do with this player. Here is the ultrasound image 
that we can see exactly where the calcification are. So we can see in the ultrasound, where do we have the, the calcification of the muscle? Using the ultrasound, we decided to take this player out of the field for some weeks and to use corticoid injection to relieve pain. So here we can see exactly about we injecting the corticoid in, in, in the calcification and this player uh, evolved very, very well two weeks after he was uh, back in field. For uh, peroneal tendonitis, this is also a very common injury that we see uh, in players who, who uh, played in, in uh, bad, bad, bad fields. So we can do an infield diagnose. We can double check and predict and monitor all the evolution of the peroneal tendonitis. We can see when we need to aspirate uh, synovial fluid from the peroneal tendonitis. So we can uh, monitor all the evolution. And this is one of the most uh, important things that we can use uh, in daily practice for muscle injuries. We can see here that we check the hematoma of the, the, the muscle. We can also check the healing process of the muscle. We can measure the hematoma through the days. And we also use the ultrasound to aspirate the hematoma and inject. And the literature shows us that when we drain this hematoma and use some adjuvant procedures, it helps the player to get back faster to uh, uh, his, uh, his time to play. He is another interesting case. In this play, present a very, very large synovial cyst in his back of his knee. Look at the size of the cyst that he present. And we, we use the ultrasound to guide and to aspirate. Look at this. We can aspirate all the cysts of the player and we can help the player to... Uh, faster get back to his uh, uh, participant in the soccer. So this is a, a, a recent player that I treat. He's a defender with medial Achilles pain. He, this is the, the, the part of the Achilles that he present pain. It's a very interesting because uh, he present a, a very degenerated plantaris muscle tendinitis who didn't solve with conservative treatment. And we decide to do a percutaneous release of the tendon. So we can see here in the ultrasound that we can uh, easily see where the tendon are degenerated. And we use a needle to see the tendon degenerated and also release percutaneously the tendon. We can see now the needle. We can see the tendon degenerated and release the tendon percutaneously. And this, this player went very, very well after this very simple procedure that we can do inside the office of the team. So it's, it's an easy way to do. And a whole message is the ultrasound, for me, is an evolution to orthopedic surgeons. We are one of the, the doctors who better understand the anatomy. And the ultrasound help us to see through this superficial anatomy better the muscle, the joint, and the movement. And the ultrasound provide us additional diagnosed information, help us to explain the pathological process to the patients, and bring us a very, very uh, nice data to treat our patients. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you guys today. Thank you, Daniel, for your nice presentation. Uh, one can feel very well that you are really um, on the field uh, we, and in acute setup. That's great. Thank you. So now um, we will continue with the next presentation. And this is Eric Ferkel um, from California. And he will uh, talk us about Jones fractures treatment. Um, please, Eric, feel free.
Eric, maybe you have to unmute quickly. We don't hear you. Can we have the technical support quickly? It looks like you're unmuted. There might be something else going on. Can uh, Carolyn, can you guys troubleshoot with Eric? Victor, you want to jump to the next one? Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay. So, are you there, Eric, now? No, huh? not yet. Okay, so we're, let me continue now with Kochi. Kochi yes. from <clears throat> Japan. Uh, he will talk about the Osu people are in soccer, which can be also a problem from time to time. Please, uh, Kochi, thank you for uh, being here. Yes. Can we have the presentation of Kochi, please? Thank you, Kochi. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. I am honored to meet you all and explain the common trauma in playing circle. I'd like to talk about symptomatic or which is highly related to uncle's brain. At first, I would introduce myself. What my hospital where I work with in Osaka or city of Japan. Japan is in the location of the world. Osaka is a city with population of 8.8 .8 million. This is a sad place in Japan. Osaka is located almost in the center of Japan. Kochi, sorry for this yeah. talk you. Can you go yeah. to the presentation mode of your presentation? Sorry? In can your you presentation? Hear me? Yeah, can you go to the presentation mode? Yeah. Uh... You know, on the right bottom side of PPT. No, uh, not yet. Not yet, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, somewhere up there, I don't understand Japanese. Koji, if you look down where it says 70% and go to the left uh, yeah, of the exactly. screen, that's where you want to do it. Go down with the arrow, Koji, down, down. Down? Down. Down Take to the, the right. Arrow to the right. Down, down, the other, the other side, yeah, more down, then to the right, to the right, and now to the left, and down. You see there um, a little, like a screen, a little screen? Yes. And otherwise you can leave it like it is, but you have to hit every time the new slide on the left when you talk. Can we have support from, from the technical that you can work on the screen? Otherwise, Kochi, you can continue, yeah. but yeah. hit always yes. on the left. You know, you see the left, your slides. The, so hit then number four, number five, number six, when you, you change, okay? Yeah. 
Victor, I'm, I'm, uh, I think my audio is working now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, continue like that, Kochi. Uh, but hit all the time on the on the screen. Or or you hit down at the presentation sign. Yes. Koji, I just have to hit the slide number that you want yeah. to change the slides. Mm. Eric, are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Sorry. Because let's go back to Eric, Koji, and we come back to you, okay? Yes. And the Sorry. technical people will help you. Yep. Okay. Uh, Koji, so, do you mind stop, stopping to share your screen? That way I can share mine. Koji, under share screen, you have to write, under share screen, you share have to screen. say stop sharing. On the bottom, where it says share screen. Hey, Carolyn, can you guys help out here? We're uh, in a st st uh, stalled mode here, Carolyn. All right, All right. Got, Eric, got you now. can go. Yep. Okay. Well, Eric, thank you a lot. All righty, we're audio is working now. Again, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Celine, Dr. Parekh, uh, Dr. Valdobano, for inviting me uh, and uh, everybody for being here this morning. Uh, my topic this morning will be on Jones fractures in what us Americans describe as soccer, but the rest of the world calls football. Uh, and uh, so let's get started. So what are Jones fractures? Robert Jones first described his own fracture <clears throat> uh, when he stated, while, <clears throat> excuse me, while I was dancing, I trod on the outer side of my foot my heel at the moment being off the ground, something gave way midway down the foot and the fifth metatarsal was fractured about three fourths of an inch from its base. Here's a famous player, uh, Neymar. Some of you may have heard of him, especially Dr. Baumfield, uh, where he's sustained a fifth metatarsal Jones fracture. Uh, so what is the Jones fracture describing? It describes the zone two fracture uh, at the uh, portion uh, just uh, distal to the base of the fifth metatarsal. Why is this an important area to, to understand? Well, <clears throat> the blood supply to this area is, uh, we know from multiple studies, uh, a watershed zone where fractures can heal uh, poorly. Multiple studies have shown that the uh, extra osseous circulation shows the dorsal metatarsal artery, the plantar metatarsal artery, and the fibular plantar, plant, the fibular plantar marginal artery are the main sources of uh, blood supply to this area and that a fracture distal to the tuberosity disrupts this nutrient arterial supply, creating a relatively avascular area. So describing the different uh, types of fractures in the fifth metatarsal, you have the zone one fracture, which is at the very base of the fifth metatarsal. The tuberosity fracture usually heals with a weight-bearing cast. You can put it for something in the boot. Um, I'll usually treat them non-weight-bearing for the first couple of weeks and then begin progressive weight-bearing as tolerated. Very rarely will they require surgical management, um, typically uh, when they're uh, uh, severely displaced. The zone two fractures, which are the ones that we'll be discussing today, I think still, in, at least in America, we're talking about treating them non-operatively in the non-athlete, um, although I think that paradigm uh, may be shifting in terms of the treatment management. Um, obviously, displaced fractures will need oper uh, open reduction internal fixation, and certainly in our elite athletes, treated them with a surgical uh, fixation. And then just to address the zone three fractures, which uh, have been described as a dancer's fracture, a more distal diaphyseal stress fracture, uh, relatively rarely will they need surgical management uh, if they're non-union or displacement. So going to uh, uh, zone three fractures, again, just to talk about the uh, diagnosis usually is by history, physical exam, x-ray, and then non weight management. So the introduction to zone two, which we're gonna focus on today, is really important to understand because there's a poor retrograde blood supply like we talked about. 
And then multiple studies show that the union rate is a lot higher in the operative uh, uh, patients versus the non-operative patients, especially uh, in our athletes. Um, so I do think that operative treatment is a standard of care in their elite athletes. And as I mentioned, that I think is beginning to move towards the standard of care and also our non-elite athletes as well. And also, as we see from the x-rays of the side here, despite operative management, non-unions and refractures can occur, uh, typically due to uh, either the uh, fixation, uh, maybe the screw is too small perhaps, uh, and also biology is important to understand. So a great paper by uh, Dr. Uh, Bomfield, as well as his brother, Dr. Bomfield, uh, at the medical fractures in uh, professional soccer players, showed that when they looked at uh, their athletes from 2001 to 2016, of the patients who uh, had a fracture that required surgery, uh, you see the majority of them were the attackers. Uh, their VAS scores uh, improved significantly. The pre and post AOFAS scores also improved. And that the one thing that they noticed that was the longer time to get surgery required uh, grafting, um, return to sports was relatively quick, I think, looking at approximately two and a half months post-op is uh, very quick, I think. So great job, Dr. Bombfield, on getting your players back on the field. Um, and the interesting thing I thought was that the return to play was not influenced here by the time to get surgery or the tour classification or the requirement for grafting. Another player by Dr. Giza, uh, Mandelbaum, um, in MLS athletes showed that in 21 uh, fractures in 18 players over uh, the course of uh, four years, that's 2013-2017, 95% of the players did return to sports, although 22% did have a refracture. Um, and then of the, uh, of the refractures, um, five of them were in stress areas. Uh, so although the MLS, MLS athletes did return, uh, have a high rate of return, there was also a relatively high rate of refracture. Uh, paper um, in the NFL, so a different type of football, uh, I got Dr. Anderson um, uh, during my fellowship year in Charlotte. Uh, we looked at uh, a return to play at NFL players, 27 active NFL players. Um, these are the position breakdowns. Um, looking at the uh, type of screw fixation, a solid screw, not a cannulated screw. Um, and then return to play uh, to the regular season was 93%. Uh, so 25 of the 27 did return to play. Um, and then uh, no other complications were noted here. Uh, so the majority of these players are able to return to play. So in all of these studies we're seeing here, both in NFL and in uh, MLS and in uh, the Brazilian soccer players, all players came back to sports with surgical fixation. So let's discuss about surgical fixation. Here's Dr. Valdebrano's team, the Swiss national team on the top right. Uh, and so the way I approach it is the incision between the perineals. It's a very small incision, usually about a three millimeter or three centimeter incision inserting the guide wire. And then uh, I don't uh, ever use a cannulated screw, but we're starting with the cannulated uh, uh, drill. Um, and then the idea here is that you're looking between the perineal brevis and the lateral band of the plantar fascia. Um, you can see here, this is, I usually do this all under uh, a mini C-arm. Um, it's really important uh, to also evaluate the biology. Uh, you can add uh, both autograft or allograft with the augmentation of bone marrow aspirate concentrate or PRP, if you're talking about a non-union um, in the area. Uh, one thing I like to do is hold the screw up next to uh, the fracture to really make sure that I'm getting those threads across the fracture site. And I think the really important thing is to look at is when you're starting your screw fixation, stay high and inside. Um, it's a very narrow entrance in the laterally angled portion of that shaft. Um, and so we wanna make sure uh, not to uh, go either below or inside and most multiple views on your fluoroscopy is really critical to make sure your, your, your uh, starting guide wire is in the fracture. So here's a patient of mine. This is a um, uh, American uh, soccer player uh, with the fifth metatarsal non-union. You can see the, the beaking on the lateral cortex, which is uh, evidence of that uh, previous uh, non-union that he refractured through. Um, here's a CT scan as well. Um, and then uh, at that, uh, area of the non-union, I packed it with, I use iliac crest autograph. I don't like to use calcaneal autograph in my athletes. If I can avoid it, I worry about the heel pain post-op. Um, and so I mix that with bone marrow aspirate constrict, pack the side of the fracture, and then here's his uh, post-operative uh, 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 images uh, over the course of his healing uh, back to return to play uh, for him at about uh, uh, two and a half to three months. So just uh, again, marking this out here, um, incision about two or three centimeters proximal fifth metatarsal base, high and inside the dorsal medial starting point, um, 
the making sure you're getting that view in multiple positions, uh, AP lateral oblique, and then kind of rotating the foot under fluoroscopy, uh, sequential tapping until you get the torque. And I really find that if you're torquing it and the foot's moving, that's your that's your uh, ideal uh, size. And then solid screw um, confirmation, adding the uh, BMA uh, with the allograft or autograft. And then for non-unions, I think it's really critical to address the biology. So checking the metabolic blood levels, vitamin D25, TSH, reflex T4, uh, adding the bone mass for constraint with the iliac crest, or if you like to use the calcaneal autograph. Um, and for the non-unions, really to breed in the fracture site um, and then bone grafting it. Uh, and then I also will try to tap uh, with the drill at the area of the cortex to increase the blood flow to the, the, the non-union site. Um, for me, these patients are non weight bearing for uh, three weeks uh, into a cam walker for three weeks and begin biking and swimming. Um, ideally running at five to seven weeks with uh, healing on the x-rays and practicing uh, by nine weeks. Um, and uh, here's kind of what the protocol looks like. Um, I will use bone simulators in my elite athletes and my non-unions. Um, and uh, clamshell orthosis or turco plate is also helpful uh, during the rehab to protect the fifth metarsal base. Uh, again, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Preck, for organizing this wonderful meeting. Um, and uh, back to you, Dr. Badwal. Thanks. Koji. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Nice presentation. Koji, I, I apologize in advance, but we've got five uh, minutes for you. Okay. <clears throat> oh, hot out. Can I start? Sure, go ahead, Koji. Yes. Uh, I will introduce my ethnic big boss. Uh, his name is Yoshinori Takakura. As you know, he's the uh, first president of IFAS. Uh, now he's 70 years old, but he's still energetic and good surgeon. He's also the developer of the artificial total tailors. So regarding the theology, the theory of aversion fracture of ATFL and the theory of the infused accessory ossification center are common, but they are controversial. Gastric <clears throat> symptom and instability at the lateral ligament uh, and chronic pain at the distal part of fibula. <clears throat> In 2010, Vega reported that the cause of pain is in some parties that induced by impingement of the last In 1961, Powell reported that the incidence of subfibular was 1%. Regarding the induced Incidence of rate during soccer play and constraints 20%. <clears throat> and the two cases occur per one hour, 1,000 hour of exposure. At first, take radiography for image evaluation. In pediatric cases, as it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish, the ATF review <clears throat> reported by Haraguchi is useful in such cases. In addition, stress x ray is indispensable to evaluate instability. Needless to say, CT is the most useful and first choice method of image evaluation. MRI should be performed for evaluating complications such as cartilage and soft tissue regions. <clears throat> evaluation fracture occurs as a result of ankle sprain and then instability will be induced. However, there are more cases in which instability does not remain than in cases in which instability remain in observable cases. In other words, there are more asymptomatic cases than symptomatic cases. Therefore, most cases of asymptomatic do not require treatment. <clears throat> in 2013, operative indication of chronic pain at the distal part of the fibula, symptomatic instability as the ATF or CFL, and the radiographic finding of a subfibular. As a noteworthy point, there is no tear wall identified on MRI in the series. Let me give you a brief summary of open technique. Few reported operative treatment using the modified Broadstone's procedure. And Chen, uh, <clears throat> There was no difference between the case with and without ossicles, and also there were no difference in the size of ossicle. Similarly, uh, and reported, uh, there were no difference between the cases with and without ossicles. In summary, the result of open techniques are satisfactory. 
Next, next, <coughs> next, I will introduce a spectroscopic reaction ligament repair. Uh, Kim report is there is no difference between the without, with or without this output. However, Kudo reported there were difference in LF score and preoperability to angle when they com compared between large and small oscules. Therefore, how to treat large oscules remains controversial. <clears throat> I will show uh, uh, the result of open and also technical treatment of large oscules uh, are uh, shown in previous slides. Moreover, in 2021, uh, they <clears throat> reported the Brusson procedure is not sufficient for large oscules, and anatomic ligament reconstruction is a viable option. All right, Koji, we got, uh, we got about 30 seconds left, Koji. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I will uh, show my uh, video at, at last. <clears throat> Maybe in the meantime, I want to say, um, yeah. um, because this we is, have to stop uh, here. Open technique cases, the ligament is uh, almost intact. Uh, is, <clears throat> this is my open technique. All right. Excellent. Well, Victor, if you want to wrap up and then uh, I'll, I'll yes. sign this out. Thank yeah. you, Kochi. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry for this technical issue, um, but I think your topic was very important. I want to uh, thank everybody. Um, Jesus showed us how important it is. Uh, to uh, fix, you know, uh, ankle instability in, in the uh, sports uh, soccer athletes. Uh, Daniel showed us the importance of, um, of ultrasound, uh, avoiding surgeries, being fast in diagnosis. Eric showed us uh, how important this is to fix um, a Jones fracture with solid screws intramedullary and preparing well and doing a DBM enhancement. And Kochi uh, provides us information about the os uh, subfibulare or the peroneal bone in the com combination with ankle sprain. Myself, I talk about OCL, uh, especially in ankle sprains and syndesmotic injuries. Well, it was great to have you all here. I want to thank Celine for, for your uh, support and organizing this fantastic course all over the world. Uh, thank well, you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Victor, for putting together an excellent uh, global team. We'll see you in a few minutes.